My name is Juliana Chan. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Wild Type Media Group and a science communicator based in Singapore. We are here today to discuss an unfolding situation, that of a novel coronavirus, the Wuhan virus. It is named because it first appeared in December in a seafood market in Wuhan, the largest city in Hebei province in central China, with a population of 11 million. So it has been compared to SARS, which caused the deaths of nearly 650 people across mainland China. And to date, we have already had more than 570 cases and 17 reported deaths. Just today, a few hours ago, Singapore, where I'm from, announced its first confirmed case. So we have three experts with us today to help us put in context the unfolding situation. On my left, we have Dr. Jeremy Farrar, Director of the Wellcome Trust in the UK. Next, we have Dr. Richard Hatchett, Chief Executive Officer of SAPI, which stands for Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness and Innovations. And finally, we have Mr. Stefan Bansell, Chief Executive Officer of Moderna, a US-based biotech company. So I'll start with trying to understand what we are dealing with right now. And for that, Jeremy and Richard, could you kindly tell us what we know now of the virus and what do we expect to happen next? Yeah, thanks very much, and thanks to everybody uh, for joining. Just uh, just back to a little bit, um, so you can appreciate what I'm going to say. I uh, am an infectious disease person by background, uh, worked very, very closely with China uh, during the SARS outbreak, uh, and spent 20 years living in Vietnam, and, but working very closely with many countries in the region. So that's my where I, background of where I come from. Uh, th this infection, which has come about um, from the beginning of December, uh, started, as you say, in an animal market in Wuhan um, and uh, probably um, was a virus that was infecting animals, uh, most likely, I think, bats in that market, and it <coughs> crossed the species barrier and it came into infecting humans who were working or visiting that market. Uh, subsequently, through the month of December and then the early days of January, uh, that infection spread from animal to human, but then most importantly from human to human. And now we are sort of the end of January, so we are about six weeks into this outbreak. This virus can now clearly spread between humans. It's spread by the respiratory tract. That means that uh, somebody with symptoms would have a cough, a sore throat, and would pass it to somebody else by coughing or sneezing in the same way that influenza is, is, uh, is spread around people. Um, it is not SARS. The virus is in a similar family to SARS, but th this looks different to SARS. And the difference is probably it's easier to pass between human beings. SARS was quite difficult to pass between humans, and people were most infectious uh, when they had symptoms, and therefore it was relatively easy to bring the epidemic under control. When the outbreak, when an infection spreads between humans easily, it's actually very difficult to bring the epidemic under control. And so there's a very big difference between SARS and what we believe we know about this virus so far. The infection is now spreading, of course, across China, uh, and many cities in China have reported cases. Indeed, Singapore reported a case, and other countries have. And I, I think we can uh, expect um, that there will be many more cases in China, and that there will be many more cases uh, in other parts of the world. I would stress also in comparison with SARS that the infectious rate will probably mean in the long term that it will cause less, uh, fewer people will die. 10% of people died in SARS. I suspect the mortality rate with this infection will be lower than that as it spreads to a much wider population. So what we have is a broader infection with probably a less um, marked number of people, percentage of people dying. Uh, but that is in some ways, from a public health perspective, is harder to deal with. Mm. We, we can't predict the future, um, but, and we're living in a period of great uncertainty at the moment because we don't have all the information we need. China recognized this, it shared the information very quickly, that was different to SARS, and therefore it alerted the world to this outbreak happening. That would not have happened maybe 10 or 20 years ago, and we should congratulate China in the way they've been open in sharing of the information. Um, the future, the world has got to think about how we can prepare now 
by developing vaccines. Richard will talk about that, drugs that may counter this infection, but also what we can do at a public health and societal level to try and prevent the epidemic spreading further than it might otherwise do. Thank you, Jeremy. Richard, do you have any points to add? I, I, think, I think Jeremy has given a terrific summary of what we know. I think I would like to underscore what we don't currently know and what makes it very difficult, as Jeremy is saying, to prognosticate the future. We do not have a detailed understanding of infectiousness. We are inferring a lot from the numbers of cases, and I, and I think Jeremy's um, inferences are, are strong, but, but we have to recognize that we don't know anything uh, with certainty yet. We don't understand the transmission dynamics of the disease. We don't understand yet the severity of the disease. It is very difficult during a period when the number of cases is increasing exponentially to make inferences about the severity, to understand what the mortality rate actually is. We don't know the number of cases. We don't know the extent of spread. Um, this is all critical information that will inform what is required to bring the outbreak under control, and I am sure that Chinese authorities are, are, are digging as quickly and deeply as they can to understand all of these factors. And, and so over the next several weeks and even months, um, we will have a greater understanding of all of these issues, and it will help us tailor and target our, our response appropriately. By point of comparison, uh, in, in 2009, I was working in the White House helping orchestrate the pandemic response uh, to H1N1. We knew by the end of April that the virus that was spreading H1N1 was going to cause a global pandemic. We did not have an accurate estimate of severity until August. And that was with a, a virus that was reasonably well understood from the beginning and very intensively studied. So many of these answers may not become available in, in the time fashion that we would all like. And we're going to have to make decisions under ambiguity and uncertainty, and we're going to have to make decisions that have potentially very significant cost. We, we are seeing that currently in China with some of the decisions about travel restrictions. Um, and we as an organization, CEPI, we were set up to fund vaccine development. Vaccine development is a very expensive undertaking, but if we don't take steps now, um, we, we won't have the vaccines in a timely fashion. Thank you, Richard. So, Jeremy, this is for you. So, I'm, Sing I'm Singaporean Chinese, and you may be aware that on Saturday is the first day of Chinese New Year, is Hua Ren Xing Nian Chu Yi. So, hundreds of millions of Chinese people around the world will be traveling to either go home or visit a, visit a loved one. Uh, we know that they have already locked down the city of Wuhan and others as well. Are countries taking enough precautionary measures? What else must we be doing? Thank you. Yeah, no, I do know it's China. I was born in Singapore, so I, I am ingrained in that. Um, it, in, in many ways, this outbreak, as all, so often happens, couldn't be happening at a worse time. I mean, Chinese New Year, I, th I believe I'm right in saying about 450 million people will be travelling in China alone, and then many people in the region, and then, and then globally. Um, during the pandemic of 2009, which Richard refers to when, in fact, we started working together in some ways, um, uh, we did some work in Vietnam where I was living at the time. Travel restrictions are a very important measure, a sense that the authorities are doing something. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, a very important statement to communities that this is serious. Mm -hmm. The actual impact of travel restrictions, at least in my opinion, are, are not going to be the answer. Uh, firstly, you can't stop everybody traveling. If you stop people traveling, they often find other ways to travel that, that, that may be um, not so obvious. Um, and in the end, if you are, if I were infectious now with no symptoms, I could pass it on even though you, you may not know I was sick. So travel restrictions can buy you a bit of time, and that's very important to do. It might buy you a day, it might buy you a week, it might buy you two or three weeks. But in the end, you have to be, use that time to put in place the critical public health interventions that you need, because travel restrictions on their own will not stop this epidemic moving. Thank you. So on that note, I think, uh, Richard, it's a good time to talk about CEPI, because it was launched three years ago right here in Davos, yep. in the shadow of the <coughs> Ebola outbreak in uh, West, West Africa. So what is CEPI's response to Wuhan virus? And what is on the research agenda? Sure. No, I, 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 CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, 
um, was established by global public health authorities. Jeremy played an important role with others in, in setting CEPI up um, and was funded by a number of philanthropic organizations in sovereign countries for exactly this kind of event. It was set up to develop vaccines against diseases like Ebola that we know about and to be prepared for um, the next unknown disease, the next epidemic, so that we could respond rapidly. Um, so CEPI is focused exclusively on vaccines, and we have been working very aggressively over the last couple of weeks um, to assess the situation first, uh, to try to make determinations about what steps are appropriate, and as the epidemiologic situation has unfolded, our sense of what we need to do um, has uh, become more clear, and our sense that we need to move faster and move farther perhaps has also become more clear. Um, I am, uh, I th today we can announce, in fact, uh, this is the first time that we've announced this, uh, three partnerships to develop vaccines against the novel coronavirus, um, two with partners that CEPI already works with, one a company called Inovio that will manufacture a DNA vaccine a second with the University of Queensland that will manufacture a recombinant subunit vaccine. Mm -hmm. And the third, a new partnership, in fact, uh, but one we've contemplated for quite a long time with Moderna, uh, who, and with the U.S. Uh, National Institute for Allergy and Infectious Diseases to develop an mRNA vaccine against the novel coronavirus. Our hope is to have these vaccines developed very rapidly and to move them rapidly into human clinical trials, perhaps as early as the summer. And I would like to give Stefan a chance to talk about his program. In Thank you, Richard. Stefan, maybe you could share with us about this vaccine and when we can expect it. Good. So thank you again for, for, for having me and having the company. So let me maybe say a few words about Moderna so you understand what we're trying to do here. So Moderna is a biotechnology company based in the U.S. Uh, and what we're trying to do with the U.S. government through NIH and with CEPI is to use our technology to help. Mm -hmm. So Moderna, uh, what we do is we make mRNA medicines, uh, which is, of course, a new technology, where we inject, basically, instruction into humans for humans to make their own medicine, using your own machinery of your cells to make your own protein uh, as a medicine. Uh, the company currently has 16 clinical trials around the world, including with a uh, global company like uh, Merck or MSD on the side of the world, AstraZeneca and others. We are in oncology, in cardiology, in rare genetic disease, in autoimmune disease, and of course, the topic of today, infectious disease vaccine. Mm -hmm. So far, we have started nine clinical studies around the world uh, for infectious disease vaccines. We have those more than a thousand uh, people. And we've done a few viruses, like uh, pandemic flu viruses, H10, H7, RSV, and also HMPV, PIV. So if you think about mRNA, the very interesting thing for uh, fast response is that mRNA is a platform. And that provides the potential for two benefits. One is efficacy. Because if you think about it, by using the human cells to make the protein of a virus, which is how a vaccine mechanism works, we are trying, trying to mimic a natural infection but without giving the virus. Mm -hmm. uh, the second piece, of course, is manufacturing. If you look at traditional vaccine technologies, uh, they take a lot of time to develop because every product is unique. Yes. In our case, because we have an information-based molecule, messenger RNA, it's the same technology that we use for our flu vaccine that have already been in the clinic, or Zika vaccine that we are testing in the clinic with BARDA, US agency, or the project that we're working on for uh, this new virus. So it provides a speed uh, to get very quickly clinical grade material so that you can start quick, quickly clinical trial. So if you think about the company, uh, our number one focus in vaccine, of course, is to develop commercial vaccine for viruses for which there is no vaccine on the market today. And a good example is CMV, cytomegalovirus, which is now in phase two. Uh, in the US, that's uh, one of our products for a very important uh, virus that uh, affect uh, birth defect. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what we've always wanted since we started this company is to say, because it's a platform, 
and because of what I describe as potential benefits, it would be a very nice tool for emerging pathogen. And so we've always partnered since we started the company with government agency like BARDA, which is part of the Secretary of Health in the US, or DARPA, which is part of the Department of Defense, we also a partnership with the Gates Foundation. Uh, and we're very, of course, pleased today and honored to be partnering with CEPI to join forces. And so the project here is we are providing the technology to help. And so uh, the design of the vaccine uh, has been done over the last few weeks at the NIH in the US because they have access to the sequence uh, of the virus. As Jeremy said, uh, the US government got access very quickly to the sequence, which of course is very important information to start making a product. Without that, you cannot do that. Stefan, do we have a timeline on this? We don't have a timeline yet because uh, this is an endeavor that has never been done before. Trying to go so fast for a vaccine has never been done before. We have done nine vaccines in the clinic, but we have never done it on the compressed time that we are doing now, mm -hmm. which is why we need to work together. Mm -hmm. The US government is helping us doing the design because we have great expertise there. What we are doing is we're going to make the product quality, uh, clinical grade material. Thanks to the support of CEPI, CEPI is actually funding this and I would like to give a lot of kudos to the CEPI organization because I reached out to Richard on Monday mm -hmm. uh, and by this morning uh, the agreement was in place, uh, formally signed between both organizations, which is really remarkable. As Richard said, we have been talking for a long, long time. We know CEPI well and they know Moderna very well. Um, and so, and then we will provide this material to the NIH mm -hmm. who will be running the clinical study. Thank you, thank you. That's terrific updates. Um, at this point, I would like to open it up to the floor. Do we have any questions from the audience, please? Okay, the three of you, <laughs> uh, we'll collect three questions. Please introduce yourself and give us a short, sharp question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm a journalist from China's Taishi Media. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is to Dr. Farrer and Dr. Uh, Mr. Hatchet. Mm -hmm. um, because you, you mentioned that uh, maybe the imposition of travel restrictions could, might not work because people might still try to find ways to go out and in uh, of the city. Um, is it because that Wuhan is so large, it has more than 10 million residents, that this uh, measure's effective, effectiveness might decrease? And because um, such measures on such a city of such large scale has never been imposed, um, but um, uh, do you think there's any historical uh, precedents that we can, that Wuhan can use and other cities who has been shut down can use to ensure that uh, um, public panic won't escalate and uh, uh, we have uh, enough uh, resources and necessities to provide to the Wuhan people? Thank you. Thank you. And the next question from this gentleman. I'll collect a few. Yeah. Uh, thank you. My name is Zhi Chen I'm with China's Xinhua News Agency, the State News Agency. Uh, I was wondering, uh, uh, Ms. Hatch has said you have started three partnerships to develop the vaccines, which is of enormous importance to the Chinese people right now. Uh, how confident are you you are going to start the human trial, as you said, in, in summer? Could you give us a more explicit timeline on this? Uh, how confident are you you are able to do this? Uh, have you been, I mean, talking on, or working with any Chinese authorities of government health uh, authorities? Thank you very much. Uh, maybe the, the third question and then we'll, we'll, we'll answer. Um, this is from Tsai Xin as well. Uh, I'd like to know is there any risk of the super transmission due to the block of the city? Um, and um, any suggestions can you offer to the government in terms of making sure that the local treatment cap capacities um, and resources are, suf are sufficient? Uh, I'd like to put the, put the forward the question to Mr. Farah and Mr. Hatchet as well. Thank you. I think we'll start with... Uh the travel restrictions and historical experience, uh, uh, maybe? I, 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 I think Jeremy is deferring to me. This is actually a uh, topic that we looked at <laughs> intensively. Uh, I, I, just as part of my own background, I, I also helped the U.S. Uh, develop its national pandemic preparedness plan in 2005 and 2006. And, it, and the, the stimulus for that was avian influenza, H5N1, a, a flu that had a very high mortality rate. And, and we faced a prospect at that time of uh, facing a virus with a high mortality rate when we had no other control interventions. And so the only, th in, in such circumstances, 
truly the only thing that you have are non-pharmaceutical interventions, including travel restrictions, but also including canceling mass gatherings and closing transit systems and closing schools. At that time, we devised a, we looked at how could you have those interventions implemented in a way that maximized their benefit and minimized the cost. And we developed a approach uh, that we called community mitigation interventions. And, and CDC published guidance on this several years ago. There, there is a literature um, which I would certainly encourage Chinese authorities to evaluate and review and certainly would be happy to talk with them about that, although that's not my current job. I do think one thing that's important to understand is that when you don't have treatments and you don't have vaccines, non-pharmaceutical interventions are literally the only thing that you have. And it's a combination of isolation, containment, infection prevention and control, and then these social distancing interventions. There is historical precedent for their use. We looked intensively, did an intense analysis of the use of non-pharmaceutical interventions in U.S. cities during 1918. And what we found was that cities that introduced multiple interventions early in an epidemic had much better outcomes. Mm -hmm. And uh, the challenge, of course, is it's very difficult to sustain these interventions because they impose enormous costs. And they also can produce enormous anxiety among the affected populations. It is actually the reason why it's so important to move quickly to develop things like vaccines. Thank you, Richard. I think the question from Xinhua is, what are some of the efforts with China on this? How are you collaborating with China? Sure. Right so, so members of my staff do have, through their, their personal professional networks, many of them come out of a biotech or pharmaceutical background, we do have connections with Chinese companies and, and with public sector officials. Dr. George Gao, uh, who's known to all, all of you who knows the Chinese uh, environment, the current director of China's CDC, in fact served on CEPI's uh, scientific advisory committee. Uh, so we have reached out. We are in discussions, but those discussions are not as mature as the partnerships that I announced today. Okay, we can take a couple more questions. Oh, uh, very quickly on the timeline. So, the, the, the timelines that I mentioned of, of, of potentially getting the vaccines into clinical trials in the summer, Dr. Fauci from NIAID also mentioned that timeline with respect to the Moderna program. Um, those certainly depend on the, on the development programs going well. Um, I, I think they are our, our best estimate of how quickly we could feasibly get there if we don't encounter roadblocks. It will also be very important for our regulatory partners to work with us and to help us understand what exactly is required before we can move vaccines into clinical trials. The advantage of the, of the platform technologies is that they have been in with the same platform, different vaccines, but the same platform have already been in humans, both mm -hmm. for Moderna and for Inovio, our, one of our other partners. So we think that will expedite the ability to move these into clinical trials. More questions? The lady on the, this lady on the right. Sorry. Maybe we'll take Hi. both. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah. So just, uh, just first of all, um, how concerned are you with Chinese New Year on the way? Um, what other, what else, if you were advising China, what else, what other precautions could they take? Obviously, we've got two more cases in Hong Kong as well. Um, Hong Kong, you know, has learned from SARS. But what else could China do? And lastly, um, why is this particular infection um, causing so much panic? Maybe the next question. And um, speaking to, uh, so yesterday there were 448 cases, of which 102 were defined as severe or critical, which is actually about a quarter. So coming back to the how, you know, how. We, we cannot know how what the fit, case fatality rate is, which we know was 10% for SARS and up to 37% for MERS, but MERS was less widespread. Um, but this looks, this could be actually, uh, in the, at what we're looking at, up to 25%. If uh, we assume that, we know that uh, people take a long time, days if not weeks, to actually die from a disease, and we're looking at the comorbidities that are existing, diabetes, hypertension, mm. coronary artery disease, the usual suspects. In addition, the confluence of, this is... A, pathogen which targets the lungs in a 
terribly polluted environment in the middle of winter with considerable other pathogens. And we wouldn't, I'm just trying to understand the uh, dimension yeah. of the spectrum mm -hmm. that we're looking at uh, and not wanting to downplay or over. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Go. Yeah, so, so as Richard said, you, you, when you're in these circumstances and you do not have uh, drugs specific and you do not have vaccines, you're reliant on uh, classic public health measures and and what that means is uh, hand washing and social distancing and yes restricting travel where it's at, at all appropriate uh, masks uh, and and the earlier you do that within a city the more chance you have for reducing uh, but what it does effectively is buy you some time to do the other things that are going on including the the, the vaccine development uh, why panic well the world has sort of been prepared, really sort of, if you like, sort of uh, getting ready for something like this, really since SARS uh, 18 years ago. And SARS left really deep scars on, on particularly the Asian and Toronto systems. Uh, and then, of course, we had the pandemic. So whenever you see an animal virus coming across to humans, passing between humans and causing both mild and severe disease, of course, the world is now really primed to know about that. And inevitably, that causes a degree of panic. Mm -hmm. I don't think you can over... You don't, we don't want to overstate the panic here because there is so much uncertainty. And we want to keep a sort of calm, moderated approach to it, but we do have to take this incredibly seriously because you don't often get an animal virus coming into humans, passing between humans, and being spread by the respiratory route. It's what, it's what Richard and I and many others would have been frightened of for the last decade. The only thing I'd say on severity and case fatality rates, and this is just a general statement across all of these epidemics, going back to all of them, including Nipper that I've been involved in since 1999, in the main, at the beginning of the epidemic, you see the more severe end of the spectrum. They're the people that seek hospital care, they're the people that seek intensive care, and that usually dominates your early. You can't tell for some weeks, actually, mm -hmm. until you see the full spectrum of illness, quite how severe the spectrum is. And at the moment, we're in that period of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Yes, 25% of the moment of the people may have had severe disease or be dying, mm -hmm. We don't know what that really means in terms of the denominator in the population that has the infection, how many severe, and how many are, are dying. And we could all guess, but it would be a guess, as Richard said earlier. Yes. And we sort of have to live at the moment with that degree of uncertainty mm -hmm. and not be intimidated by it. Mm -hmm. We've run out of time. Uncertainty is the last word we heard. I would like to thank our three speakers and our experts for joining us today at the Issue Briefing Room. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you.